Yes, is this working? Sounds very strange to me. It's kind of like an echo in your head. Okay, there's still some seats in the front row or further in the front, if you want. Just because you're sitting in the front does not mean you cannot leave in the middle of the talk. You can still leave. I'm not going to hold it against you. Lots of seats, if anyone wants to sit in front. If you sit in the front, you'll get the IMAX experience. <laughs> Much closer. OK. Thank you guys very much for coming. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a, it's basically an experience report for a multinational bank that I worked in, in Singapore. I'm not allowed to name the bank um, because I've not gone through legal. Can we edit that out maybe from the video later? This happened between two, 2013 and I would say um, 2015, second half of around June is when I quit. So I know what happened since and it's not gonna get any better. But while we, while we did this, it was awesome and we did a really, really good job, I think. Okay, very quickly about me. Um, oh, you guys will also notice that I'll, I use a lot of Legos in my slides in general. Um, something I would like to promote as well, it's called Lego Serious Play, where you use Lego at work for a very, very serious purpose. For example, you can come up with a business strategy using Lego. And it works very, very well. And I just like Lego, it's fun. So, my name is Michael Chick. Um, originally, I'm from Europe. I lived and worked in London and in Singapore. And this experience report is from Singapore. And I now live in Hong Kong. I work a lot with financial organizations. Um, they pay me quite a lot of money to work with them. Pa my passion, however, is to work with startups. So I, I also work with a lot of startups. I do something called lean startup with them. But they don't pay very well. Most of them actually do not pay at all. Mm -hmm. But it is so much fun. Um, I work for companies like JP Morgan in Singapore, Cafe Pacific in Hong Kong, Fidelity International in Hong Kong as well, and some other companies that you may know. OK, um, quick show of hands. You don't even know the question. <laughs> Fine. But there's three questions. I, I, OK, who here works at a startup? See? OK, no one? Uh, you work at a startup? Define a little bit. Of a startup. Well, it means, why do you still only work a little bit at a startup? If you're the acting product owner at a startup. Not with a, the same startup. Uh -huh. Yes. Same as me. Brilliant. Yes. Um, who here works at the multinational corporation? That is a lot. Wow. Okay. That's basically everyone. Uh, who here works in financial services? Wait. No one here? One person here? So all the hands over there. Okay. Um, if you work for finance in financial services and if you work in for a multinational corporation, you'll probably see certain patterns that, in general, they're very, very slow when it comes to change or implementing change. Um, so, something really, really remarkable happened at JP Morgan in 2013. We, at JP Morgan, decided to go on a radical change. They decided to implement something called large-scale scrum. Um, there are some other talks about large-scale scrum at this conference. I will not actually tell you guys much about large-scale scrum. I'll just mention that we have implemented it. There are some concepts that I will tell you about, but if you want an introduction to the framework, I think some other talk at this conference might be better. So we went on this 
remarkable journey where suddenly in a 3,000 people part of the organization worldwide across, I think, five different locations, or even actually even more, we decided to completely change the organizational structure. If you know anything about LESS, LESS requires you to change the organizational structure. It requires you to implement something called feature teams. And if you can, LESS would also require you to uh, flatten the organizational structure. So we went out, we did all that. We, we went from, I think, four level of hierarchies on the ground to just one. Okay. Four levels of hierarchies to one hierarchy. That was really, really flat. There was an advantage at JP Morgan, as in JP Morgan does not have fractional job titles. JP Morgan tends to have um, hierarchical job titles, or based on the level that you are. They made it very much easier, for example, to not have senior developers, because there were no senior developers in the, in the first place. Damn it. Thank you. I did not say JP Morgan. I actually said it a lot, didn't I? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Tim over here, he's one of the coaches that we work with as well. He was based in the US, and his role is to transform the whole organization. Whereas my role was more um, focused on Singapore and a little bit India, a tiny little bit. But in India, again, we have different coaches. Um, okay. And th the thing that I'm really, really proud of is we did Scrum right. Not just large scale Scrum, I think we did Scrum right. Did everything work out very well? Actually, no, we still have problems. And I'll tell you, you guys about those problems um, in, this, in this presentation. But it was brilliant, it was awesome. I woke up in the morning thinking, yay, another day at work. And you don't have this feeling a lot especially if you work for a big multinational corporation. So most of you guys work at a big multinational corporation. Who here wakes up in the morning thinking, yay, another day of work, I can't wait to go to work. If you do, please raise your hand. Yes or no? You seem undecided. So you actually wake up in the morning, sir, thinking, yeah, can't wait to get to work. Great. But as you can see, it doesn't happen very easily. We had that, and I'm, I'm super proud of that. Okay, this is as much time as I will spend on less in this talk as possible. So, less, this is basically less. You have up to eight teams that scale. It's, in essence, it's Scrum, with one addition at the end which is called the overall retrospective. That's it. If you want to scale beyond eight teams, there is something called less huge, which adds a little, a couple of additional rules to this framework. But in essence, that's about it. That's the scaling framework. It relies very heavily on Scrum. Actually, one of the principles is less is Scrum. That's less huge, it looks more complicated because it, somehow they had to make it look more complicated, I think, to emphasize this is for scale. Okay, we did Scrum really, really well. We presented um, at Agile Singapore. That's actually where we first presented. Um, this is the quote that I have from a, one of our managers. We also did something to the manager. So one of the things that you oftentimes see um, in the literature is, if you go to Scrum, what happens to managers? What do they do? Do they have a role? Do we just fire them? Do we merge them back into the teams as developers? We turned them into, well, either developers or we call line coaches. So we did really well. We were proud of it. We presented at conferences. We presented at Agile Singapore twice. Um, we, there were, there were info queue articles that we wrote. And at least within Singapore, I think we were the most agile bank out there. And not just the most agile bank, 
the bank that was willing to take risk by doing some upfront reorganization or some actually a lot for a bank this was really revolutionary um, this you can't really see this very well this is a slide that Tim Bourne, who sits over there, normally he's not present when I give this talk, um, wanted to give at the Scrum Gathering in New Orleans in 2014. Again, we do Scrum, we do Scrum really well, and we are proud of it. Some of us used to joke that, yeah, we are best in class. And every time we went to, um, every time we went to community meetups, and when we told people, hey, I work for JP Morgan, the response was always, wow, how did you guys do this? Can you give us some tips? That was until <coughs> suddenly we had a crackdown. So now at JP Morgan, we don't have any large scale scrum, I can't think large scale scrum implementations, we don't have any large programs that run scrum anymore. Right? We do? How big? Oh, okay. None that I knew about. He knows about it. Um, as far as I know, this was the largest, though. And huge crackdown that didn't come all of a sudden, but it gradually crept in. And there were first signs that we saw it that we saw in December 2014. That's when suddenly there was a little bit more pressure put on us with deadlines. Be before, we were able to mostly set our own deadlines like you're supposed to in Scrum, unless it was a regulatory deadline, then it was of course imposed on us, and we had to work with that. Um, December, deadline started to creep in again. Um, there was a bigger emphasis again on the annual review cycle, and bureaucracy was added. There were more signs. In January and February 2015, um, and also that's when people started to quit because no one likes change. And if you're an agile coach, you don't like change to going back towards waterfall at all. So probably agile coaches dislike change most. I can say that for me because I quit as well. I quit a little bit later, but I quit as well. Okay, um, right now we have the four layers of hierarchies reinstalled in our team, um, basically everything that we did before has been undone. Oh, sorry, no, we now have five level of hierarchies. We are more hierarchical than we were before. Yes, one additional layer. <coughs> um, yes, sounding more like a farm. Okay, damn it. Oh, yes. So after we, again, those four layers crept in, five layers crept in gradually. After we had those four layers, um, we had a manager that didn't have enough time to actually take care of all the people underneath him, so he created an additional layer, which is what normally happens. And also very important, we are now stressing once again 100% resource utilization, which we did not do before. Not that it ever works out, but it kills the system. And it, I, I think it's fair to say it's killing that program at that multinational bank that I work for right now. We let it up, uh, well, it was for the team to decide. And we all went for, I think, the, as a general guideline, we went for about 70% of your time in the, in the sprint plannings, account for roughly 70% of your time. The rest was done, unforeseen stuff. It never worked out either. It didn't even work out in, in, in Scrum. Did I answer your question? Yes. Great. 
Um, also, now they're ending up doing a lot of rework. So a lot of people, because they're doing busy work, you end up reviewing exactly the same thing again. It really doesn't get any better, uh, any worse, I think. Um, and uh, lots of people have quit since. So even after I left. Oh, you can't really read that. Okay, so the way I structured it, so this is as much as I will talk about the company as such and its culture. Um, the way I structure my talk is, it's about lessons that I have learned while working there. I wouldn't even say lessons that in general, a lot of people, or everyone has learned at that company, because I don't think they've learned any lessons. Mm. Okay, I have to work on a comp class. Okay, so I'm, I want to start with stuff that we tried and that worked really well. And even now, uh, the companies I work for at the moment, I try to replicate some of these things where I think it makes sense. Um, if you do less, there's a requirement that you have to have co-located teams. It doesn't mean you cannot actually use teams in a different geographical area. It just means that if you have a team, everyone in that team has to sit in the same place. So you can have one team in India, you can have one team, I don't know, in Moscow, you can have one team in New York. That's fine. Just don't have one team where two people are in New York and two people are in Moscow. That worked really, really well for us. Co-located team. We worked across five different time zones. I think we made that work as well as we could. I don't think you can actually make it work well. At least I've never ever encountered anyone who can make that work well. Um, and the most, the biggest positive effect that we got out of that was high bandwidth communication. Within the team, everyone was able to communicate with each other at any given time. We also created WhatsApp chat groups. Uh, most, I would probably say 80% of what people wrote on WhatsApp was banter and not really useful, but sometimes it actually helped a lot. What we did encounter, however, was um, a us versus them mentality that slowly arose. So basically, if you're part of a team, you distinguish yourself by well, seeing who's inside and who's outside. And we started getting competi unhealthy competition within teams. Before we were able to actually tackle that, we were shut down. Um, so the only thing I can say is be careful. If you see that pattern, do something against it. Or do something to prevent it in the first place. OK, another thing that we did that worked really, worked really, really well, feature teams. Um, if you've been here this morning with the keynote, where, damn it, I can't read. Yes. Where he said, don't do feature teams. It doesn't end up very well most, in most cases. Sometimes it really doesn't end up well. I've seen a lot of cases where it doesn't. In most of our cases, it did work well. Um, did we end up with bad code? Yes. We did end up with people who wrote bad code and then thought, oh, someone else is going to clean it up. But those people were always kind of named and shamed. So that they, Many of them stopped doing it unless it was a complete team, unless the whole team actually wrote back code. That we weren't able to stop. Everyone named and changed them, but that didn't work. Um, it drastically reduced time to production. Initially, before we did the um, agile implementation, we had a release once every six months, I believe. And after that, we went to two releases a week. It was actually a little bit too fast for most of the business, and they asked us to, 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 to do only one release a week. And at the time when we were shut down, it was moved to, I think, one release every two weeks. Now, as far as I know, it's quarterly. So again, we're moving towards the wrong direction. But it worked really, really well while we did it. Does, by the way, does anyone here not know what a feature team is? If you don't know what a feature team is, raise your hand. Very, very important. Because it's one of the big learnings that I have. Feature teams can work if you put the right constraints on your team. 
product owners, we spend a lot of time coaching product owners on how to actually write, I, I hate the word requirements. So our product owners, owners didn't actually write user stories, so I can't say user stories. Um, I guess they were requirements. So we, we spend a lot of time training the product owners to only write down problems that they wanted us to solve, rather than the solution. Again, phenomenal effect on the teams. They only receive problems, and most developers like solving problems. It helps, it helps the motivation and morale. Um, yeah, but that's also where the danger comes in. We spend, I, for at least two or three months, I probably spend about 70% of my time with the product owners, just to coach them. And other coaches had to do the same. It took a long time, but I would say the investment, it was a good investment. If you can, do that. People coaches, when you go through your transition, people won't really, they will be very intimidated, afraid. They won't really know what to do. Some of those people will quit. The people who stay, you still need to guide them and coach them into it. It's one thing that you might be able to do if you're an agile coach or you hire someone, but that's not scalable. And I think it's always a bad idea to hire an agile coach anyway. I say that even though I am an agile coach, and that's how I actually earn my money. But in its essence, agile coaching is not scalable. So one of the things that we started doing was actually get, getting training people up as coaches. Not as agile coaches, but as people coaches. That worked really well. Um, we also had Scrum Masters focus on becoming coaches. Actually, that was our first point of contact. So we put a big emphasis on telling, or well, making sure that the Scrum Masters understood that it was a people role, not a process role. Uh, with this slide, I'm trying to say everyone needs coaching. So as a coach, how many people can you coach? In order for it to be scalable, you need a lot of coaches. Maybe, but there's also the, the other side that most agile coaches aren't actually coaches. So hiring co agile coaches won't solve your problem. You need coaches. Did I answer your question? Okay, I'll take that. Fine. Um, okay, overall, high morale, really, really positive impact. Um, initially, we had very, very high quality as well. That was initially. Later, it deteriorated a little bit. Um, and teams had, they did. It didn't feel very daunting, despite the large scale that we had. Okay, next point. Things that we tried that did not work so well. So it didn't work so well for us as a move. You guys can try it. Um, I've met a lot of other people who tried this as well, and it actually did work for them. So one thing is self-designing teams. It didn't work very well for us. Um, everyone loved the exercise, though. And the teams that were formed when we did the self-designing team exercise, the team members themselves were actually very happy. But where it did not work was, hello? Is it still working? Did I stop doing my echo? Hello? OK, I can just speak louder. Um, where it did not work, was all the teams that we that we got, we had a low rate of, of diversity. People ended up tr sticking with people that they already knew. If you, 
if you're allowed to form your own team, you probably don't want to end up in a team with people you, you don't know at all. It's one of the things where we did not put, actually put a constraint on that. So we ended up with one team that where 70% of um, team members were female. Basically, all the female developers that we had went into the team, which, on the other hand, none of the other teams had female members. So diversity was very low, and sometimes it also reflected in the skill set. So we ended up with um, team members where we had a lot of XBAs. XBAs turned developers. We had a team where we had a lot of X testers. And you probably don't want that to happen. Yeah. So the question is, did we put any constraints on that? No, we did not, which is why we ended up with that. Um, there's only so many times you can do this exercise. So we, we did it again once, but that's it. So in total, we did it twice. And we learn something every time. So that's, the learning is at the bottom. If you do this, make sure you have the right constraints. You can never think of everything, but Maybe read a couple of blog posts, read about people who've gone through this exercise, and read about their mistakes. I'm sure this can work really, really well. Just didn't work well for us. Did I answer your question? Um, Self-organizing teams. This is more controversial, way more controversial. Um, didn't work very well for us. Why? We had a lot of people who played the system. So what we gave every team the freedom to be self-organized. Um, it normally comes with a caveat that you have to follow the rest of Scrum, and one of the very, very important principles of Scrum is transparency. It only works if they follow er the whole package. So our teams didn't follow transparency. They hid a lot of their work, and suddenly, after five months, ta-da, there was a new system in place. That they wrote, and no one actually knew they had written it. They were very proud of it. It ended up actually being a very useful system, but imagine it had ended up being a not useful system. So by luck, it actually ended well, by sheer luck. What we discussed this for a very, very long time internally, and one of the things that we think we should have done was rather than go from absolute control that you normally have in, in multinational corporations to freedom and instead actually ease the controls and slowly guide them into self-organization. That's certainly a mistake I will not make again. Because yeah, that sometimes we had really, really horrible teams. Um, next one, we turned our senior managers into line coaches. So for Singapore, we had uh, location coaches. For Singapore, we had one location coach. Um, for India, I think we had one location coach, if I remember correctly. And the role of the person was to enable the rest of the organization to adopt less, to adopt scrum, to adopt agility, uh, to adopt the mindset. So we from what I've been told, because that preceded my joining there, from what I've been told, he was deliberately called coach, because the role of the person would have been to coach people. As far as I know, this did not work in any of the locations where we implemented it. Did not work? Good, okay, I'm not the only one who thinks that way. Um, for Singapore specifically, we ended up having a location coach who basically didn't do much. Um, he didn't do any coaching. And the rationale behind not doing any coaching was the teams are now self-organizing. Um, I'm not actually entirely sure what that coach did most of the time. 
but he looked busy. That's all I can say. What, what we, what I learned out of this is that if you come up with with new positions that you create specifically for senior management or for anyone, that you're probably better off letting go in the first place. Be clear about roles and responsibilities. So the role or responsibility of that location coach was never really, really clear. It was always fluffy and vague and a good idea, yes, but what we do with that really doesn't turn out well. Another thing that we did, completely failed for us, we actually hoped that the people would not game the system. Almost every team ended up ended up gaming the system. Um, what does that mean? It's, we don't know why. We think it's a mix between competition between games. Oh, sorry, competition between teams. Um, one big reason that we are assuming is just in there is the bonus system. We don't think it's only the bonus system, um, but uh, obviously, sorry. No, it wasn't the appraisal system, as far as I know. Um, so we had an agreement with HR that no one actually gets a bad, bad rating in the appraisal system. So at least on that level, everyone should have felt safe. Yeah. Yes, feature team. Sorry, what is your question again? Is it a slash between? Yes. Oh. When you implement feature teams, all the teams have to be long living, as in you don't swap people in and out. In in general, there is a agile a tendency in agile that you have longer lived teams. You don't always swap them out. But you tend not to have a project team. It's a bad idea. When I say project team, I mean teams that form according to a project. As soon as the project is delivered, you dissolve the team. And then you start the next project, you create a new team. You don't do not tend to have that in Agile. Sorry, I, I'm not sure I understand your question. Okay, one feature team develops. You mean, you mean after it's in production, do they have to support it? Yes, they do. No. Support work is just like any other kind of incoming work. But they do have to support it. Otherwise, um, again, which probably ties into this slide, if teams don't know, uh, if teams know they don't have to support it, they will optimize for that. So there are certain trade-offs that you can make. Short term, you everything is great, but in the long term, you know something will happen. If you have to support it, you probably will not make that trade-off. If you do not have to support it, then yeah, you make everything look good for now. OK, I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly, so, uh, but I'm still going to ask you. Did I answer your question? Did I answer that specific question? No, it won't change. 
not just in feature scenes, in Agile in general, it does not tend to change. Okay. Um, now I lost my train of thought. Gaming the system, probably, so bonus system was a huge impact. We were not able to get rid of that. Um, it was not appraisals, but normally appraisals would be in here as well. Expect so there was one part of the appraisal system that we were not able to get rid of, which was you need a certain duration of very positive outcomes or very positive appraisals in order to be considered for promotion. That was still there. And people were trying to actually get there specifically. We tried different approaches for that, also with the bonus system, um, like people nominating other people who they think were actually performing really, really well. We tried different systems and none of them worked. We, every system we tried, they just optimized for the system. So at one stage it was basically a popularity contest. So people just would regularly give out tweets and do other stuff to make themselves popular, to get more votes. That was one of the systems we tried. We were not able to track it. I don't think anyone so far has been able to track it unless, well, if you have a bonus system. Team selecting their own scrum masters, another thing that we tried. Um, there are some organizations that I've met or that I talked to where this worked really well. I don't think it worked well for us. So we, we had a lot of teams where you had XBAs that turned into developers or programmers, and they weren't very comfortable with the new role. So when we came up with hey, you guys can decide yourself who is going to be your Scrum Master. And if you're interested in becoming a Scrum Master, just volunteer. So we had a lot of people who just didn't want to be developers. And they volunteered. And also we had a lot of people who thought, oh, being a Scrum Master is easy. You don't actually have to do much. All you do is sit around and during meetings you say, okay, you speak, someone else speaks, or you do some kind of facilitation. Um, that's probably because they saw a bad Scrum Master do that. So we ended up with a lot of scrum masters who were basically just not developers. They wanted to get out of the system. Then we had some teams who thought, oh, who is our worst developer? Let's promote him to become a scrum master. Because he's dragging us down. Um, the downside was, the, the additional downside was, even after they'd become scrum masters, the team wouldn't treat them differently. They would still treat the scrum master as a very, very normal team member. So sometimes when a, when a Scrum Master would suggest something that's actually, that was actually good, they just say, ah, no, what do you know? You used to be a very, very bad developer. So why are you asking us to do this? Yes? Well, if you volunteer, you still have to be voted in. So if you volunteer, but no one, yes, by the team. If you volunteer, but no one actually wants you as a Scrum Master, you are still not going to become a Scrum Master. So I've seen places where this worked really well. Just didn't work very well for us. Um, I, we're not entirely sure. We think, again, it, it goes back to from total control to complete freedom. Yes? Actually, most team members were already certified Scrum Masters. Yes, when we started the transformation, no, it wasn't. When we started the transformation, we gave bas basically everyone on the floor um, we sent them to certify Scrum Master training. As a Scrum Master, you have a very different role. That means you get treated differently. It comes with a role. No, nope, not a leader, not a boss. But what is, what's the role of a Scrum Master? Making sure that the team understands, not just the team, the organization, 
follows and understands from. So, how do you do that? You have to sometimes make suggestions or do other things or tell people, hey, actually, this is the stand-up. It, it's not here to just do this and that. And every time a Scrum Master would do that, the team would say, who are you? You're just a bad developer. So they wouldn't accept those suggestions. Yes? No, we did this in the beginning. This was in the beginning. No, only full-time Scrum Masters. We did not allow part-time Scrum Masters. And I honestly don't think it's a good idea. In general, it's not a good idea. Sometimes, it's the only thing you can do, but in general, avoid that. What, what, what? Full-time Scrum Master. Yes. They did have a variant in size, but uh, only the small Scrum variant that you see. So our guideline was, I think, our guideline was 7 plus minus 2, the normal guideline, when we did the self-designing teams exercise. I don't remember if it was 7 plus minus 2 or 6 plus minus 3, but similar size. Yes. Oh, okay, so the question is, if a Scrum Master is not available for whatever reason, is anyone taking, taking over or covering the role? Yes, the other Scrum Masters. If you have, full -time, if you have a team of full-time Scrum Masters, then another Scrum Master can cover you. Did that answer your question? No, sounds like a bad idea, in general. It depends. It depends very much what you see the role of the Scrum Master is. If the Scrum Master facilitates all your meetings, and act, then it might be a little bit harder to scale. But if the Scrum Master, if you treat the Scrum Master's role actually more like enabling self-organization for the team, where the goal of a Scrum Master, you might say, is to make himself jobless, unemployed, then it's very, very scalable. Because a lot of the stuff that in outside organizations, a scrum master does can actually be done by the team. So our goal was initially we had one scrum master per team. Later on, we scaled it up to one scrum master covering two teams, or one good scrum master. And very rarely we had one scrum master for three teams, and I, that didn't work out very well. No, no, there wasn't a requirement. Most people in the organization actually thought that. Um, most of our, a lot of our coaches thought that, but that was not one of the requirements. Another thing we tried and failed is the Boy Scout rule. Um, Boy Scout rule says, if you go somewhere, and you, if you go to a camping site, leave it in a better state than you found it in or when you leave, basically. And you can apply that to code. So if you delve into especially legacy code and you do something with it, just leave it in a better state 
when you found it in the first place. Um, it's a nice principle. It just didn't work for us because a lot of people, a lot of teams went in, changed the code. So I was probably even messier than before. And they thought, okay, yeah, maybe someone else will clean it up, or I'll just come back later and clean it up. And maybe you know from your own experience, if someone thinks I'll come back later and clean that, it's never gonna happen. At least in our case, it never happened. No, not a formal one. Informal one, yes. Okay. Um, collective code ownership, again, didn't work very well for us. If everyone owns it, our, from our experience, in this case, was no one owned it. But that was, in, again, that was just in this case. I've encountered a lot of organizations where it actually works. So I know it can work, and if it works, it works really well. Didn't work for us. But give it a try. We think it didn't work because the teams competed against each other. I don't feel scale. Okay. We did really well, but in the end, scaling had a huge cost. It was worse when we had to work uh, with the US. So in Singapore and Delaware, where the US headquarters were, it was a 12 hour time difference, which basically meant whenever you have meetings together, everyone is in pain. There is no way to have a meeting where someone feels okay, at the very least, or happy even. So 12 hour time difference means 9 a.m. in one location means 9 p.m. in the other location. So you get into the office at nine, you have a meeting. The other side, it's evening. You don't want to do that meeting at 9 p.m. There's no overlap where at least one side feels comfortable and you can just rotate it. That really, really had a huge cost. The impact was people, well, decisions took a really long time because people were actually trying to avoid talking to the other side. Because every time they had to talk, it was a pain. And we want pain. If you don't really have a need to, and we don't think we actually had a need to scale. A lot of the stuff that we did, you could have just done it in one larger location. It would have been, in essence, I think, cheaper. Okay, I've got to be quick. Things that we tried did not work, and I, none of us who work there think it will ever work. So don't try this. Um, don't try your implementation, your agile, large-scale implementation with revolutionary change. We made a lot of changes, which was, in essence, actually really good. But if you make a lot of changes at the same time, you don't know what is, what is the result. Well, you don't know what which change results in. You, you, put a, you put, I don't know, 56 new rules in place, and you get Result C, you don't know which of those rules actually contributed and which of those rules actually went against it. The only thing you can see is the overall outcome. Don't try and, don't try and do revolutionary change. When you scale, do it gradually, slowly. It will also help you when it comes to resistance, changing people's behavior. Basically, just don't do it. it I, we can't think of any case where it will ever work. And that's six of our coaches at JP Morgan. They all agree with this. Um, we ended up having development teams. Yes. If you do this, you need a lot of good coaches. If you do gradual change, you might get away with having no coach or having one coach. And also, if you can, limit change in progress. So don't implement more than, I don't know, three changes at any given time. We ended up with development teams 
that were literally developers or programmers. Um, we, we educated our testers and our BAs to become developers. I don't think that was a good idea at all. A lot of people felt out of place. Their morale was damaged. And honestly, some of them were just not very good developers. Um, instead, I would suggest that you actually integrate testers and BAs into your team. Yes. Now, is it very is it, is it a very specific problem? Okay, come to me after the talk. Done. Okay, don't do time zones. Great, I'm out of time. Seriously, don't do time zones. That was probably the worst thing we did. Okay. I'll, I'll finish with don't do time zones before they kick me out. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any questions, come to me now, I guess. I'll probably be outside if the next speaker's already here. Um, Oh.